encourage you to stay standing for the reading of God's word. If you're new with us today, I want to say welcome. We also want to say we stand in honor of God's word as it's read every week. In fact, we'll read the book of First Timothy over time as we're starting a verse-by-verse study here, and you will see that the public reading of scripture is a non-negotiable in the gathering of God's people. And so we're going to pick it up where we're going to kind of do a two-parter here, but we're going to read the whole text, and I will break down half of it this week, and we will deal with the second half of it next week. First Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. This is the word of the Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. You can be seated. Good morning. We doing all right? Excellent. Vibrant little crew here. Uh, hey, 1 Timothy chapter 1 is where you're going to need to be today. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And if you're joining us on live stream, welcome. We're glad that you're able to also get your Bible out and also go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. The good news about being on live stream, I suppose, is you can stop it. If I talk too fast, everyone else here just has to deal with that. Uh, excited to jump into a new series with you. By the way, my name is Scott. I'm the lead pastor here at Doxa Church. And if you're new, I usually uh, try to sneak out a little bit early so I can meet you guys. If you go out into the lobby and you want to chat, tell me your story, just get to connect a little bit. I absolutely love doing it. And uh, if you want to hang out with me, I would love to talk with you. Uh, But in the meantime, we're going to get after God's word here because this is what we do. There's nothing more important we do as God's people than gather under the word of God and hear it and receive it and live in light of it by God's grace. Amen. And so there's nothing more important we could be doing. And so first Timothy is the book we're studying. The series title is the dearest place on earth. And so if you are looking for that place this morning, you have found it. You are here. God's people On God's day, gathering to hear God's word, this is the dearest place on earth. That is a quote from Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, who said, give yourself to the church. Find one, make it a good one, make it a biblical one, and give yourself to the church. And, and, and so we're going to go through and we're going to see what the church is supposed to be and what it's supposed to do and how it's supposed to act because it turns out we have some really important responsibilities. Turns out that the Lord, through his word in First Timothy, actually wants to mold us and shape us in some ways. And we said last week that the primary overarching big idea of First Timothy is that the church needs to, must be the place where God's people conduct themselves and are ordered in a way that reveals the mystery of Christ in the gospel most accurately, most effectively, and most beautifully. 
that we don't get to make up how we do church and what we do in church and how we're to organize ourselves. All of that is specifically ordained by God, revealed in his word, and the gospel's at stake if we mess with it. And we are a gospel people, and we love the gospel, and we want Christ. Don't we want Christ to be portrayed through us? Not, not necessarily in the way the world will receive it, but in how Christ wants it perceived by people. And so we come to the beginning of this letter, and the question is really like, well, you know, where does a church like that, a kind of church that's honoring of God, the dearest place on earth, where does a church like that start? Or you might say if you're new and you're trying to figure out what is Doxa and how does it fit into your church shopping that you're doing, right? You're kind of in the midst of like a buffet of churches. We're one of seven. No? Don't worry, it's between you and me. I know, I know. We're, we're, you're just here on a, in a one-stop shop trying to figure things out. And you're kind of asking the question, what kind of church am I supposed to give myself to? Well, I think you're going to get your answer today. And if I could put it simply and maybe even quote from the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 4, how about this? Give yourself to a church who watches their life and their doctrine closely. So the title of the message this morning is this, The Fails of False Teaching. The Fails of False Teaching. We're going to address part one of what I read. Verses 3 to 11 is one big idea. We are going to address verses 3 through 6 in a message called The Fails of False Teaching. Now, it could be argued, and I'm sure we could have a conversation about this that could be robust, but that nothing is fundamentally more important than the church's teaching, okay? When you're thinking about a church, and I know one of the things, parents, on your mind is, where do my kids connect? That cannot be the most important thing that makes the decision for your church. What church home you have, what church you belong to, well, my kids like it here. That can't be number one. It should be argued that the most important thing in a church is its teaching. And in fact, you see that modeled in the church at Ephesus. See, 1 Timothy is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to Timothy, who's going into the church at, do we know? Ephesus, okay? And in Ephesus, this church was started and founded by the Apostle Paul, and he was essentially their first pastor, in a sense, And he spent three years there, and you see some of the reality of what Paul spent his time doing in Acts chapter 20, and you can feel free to look at that. I want to give you a sense for just how important the church's teaching is. He's founded this church, and he's speaking to the Ephesian elders from Miletus, knowing that he might never see them again. In fact, that was the mentality And he speaks about several important things about the church's teaching, namely in verse 20, he says that he didn't shrink from, isn't that interesting language? He didn't shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. You think there are Bible teachers, Bible pastors that are shrinking from teaching some things? Isn't it interesting that Paul would use that language? Do you think that's a 21st century issue that are just pastors now that are shrinking from teaching it? No, because what goes around at sin is, uh, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. Sin is sin. He says, man, it was important to me to not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you in public and from house to house. I was teaching you. This was important to lay that foundation. He goes on in verse 24 or 27 to talk about it again. He was committed to not shrinking from declaring, listen to this, the whole counsel of God, all of it. Not the part that the pastor wants to share that's convenient to fill in a message he already has with a bunch of illustrations he already has because he knows you guys are gonna wanna hear it and you'll come back if he tells it right. Paul didn't shrink from declaring the whole counsel of God. You know there's some offensive parts in the word? Do you know that? He didn't shrink from 
declaring the whole counsel of God. He didn't shrink from testifying, verse 24, to the gospel of the grace of God. So any Bible preaching church, listen, if you have a Bible preaching church that isn't founded ultimately upon the gospel, that's also an issue for the teaching, right? He makes it his life's mission to testify. I don't care much about my life. Where it comes or where it goes, if only I may finish the mission that the Lord Jesus Christ has entrusted to me, namely to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. See, it could be argued that nothing is more important than the teaching. You could keep going down on in, in the story in Acts chapter 20 about the church. Paul actually warns the elders of the church in Ephesus, saying... Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. This is so important. Bad teaching affects the whole flock. You know what's so interesting about bad teaching is bad teaching is weirdly attractive. The goats will flock to listen to that. You need to pay careful attention because of that to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God. He goes, I know, I know that after my departure, because he's leaving, wolves will come in from among you. Now, if you're looking for someone in a wolf's outfit to come into church, you're going to be like, I don't see any wolves ever. But see, Jesus told us that wolves like to dress up in sheep's clothing. Most people think error is going to be this overt, super obvious, wow, that's off error. Guys, the reason error works, it's because it seems remarkably close to the truth. Sometimes it even seems truer than the truth. So it's not like it's going to come in and be like, we hate Jesus. Like, well, that's wrong. Okay, it's not going to be like that. Worse, it's not just that fierce wolves are going to come in, and wolves don't dress like wolves. Wolves dress like sheep. They're going to come in from among you, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things. Own selves, from among your own selves, from among the ones that you trust. That's why you got to pay careful attention to this. This is so important. How many of you could tell a story that for 20 years you trusted the leadership? You trusted their doctrinal convictions. You trusted their ability to rightly handle the word of truth. That's why we ought to always be paying careful attention to ourselves and to all the flock of which the elders specifically are entrusted with the care of the church because from among you guys, from among the elders in the church, from among the leaders will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Well, lo and behold, that was written roughly during Paul's t- or about Paul's time in 53 to 56 AD. This was written in about 64 AD, so roughly 10 years later, the very thing Paul was talking about was happening in the church in Ephesus, and he's leaving Timothy there to address the issue that was going on with the elders. This was happening. How many of this is your story? You've, you've, you've experienced this before. And he sends Timothy in to address the elders. Any of you tried to address elders before and it didn't go very well? Especially when you try to out some of their theology? Of course, there's a way to do that, right? Maybe you didn't nail it. But it probably wasn't the most comfortable conversation either. Paul's so concerned about what's being taught in the church at Ephesus that he gets right to business. It's the first thing that comes out. Chapter one, here we go. Let's do it. Not a moment to waste. Big idea for this morning. False teachers must be charged to cease and desist, period. We don't talk to them. We don't invite them over. Try to get them convinced of something else. False teachers must be charged to cease and desist because they divert from the gospel. False teaching is diverting from the gospel. False teachers who divert from the gospel must be charged to cease and desist. And I want to show you why in the text this morning. I want to show you why this is so important. Paul's absolutely committed to one thing. What you do with false teachers is really straightforward. Stop them. Stop them. I know it's not going to sound nice. 
You know, one of the things Christianity in our day is built off of is what I've heard is called the 11th commandment, which is niceness, right? And if it's not nice, it doesn't even matter. It could be totally true, but you didn't say it nice. You weren't nice enough. Paul's like, listen, I'm not talking about being nice at all. I'm saying if you see false teaching that diverts away from the gospel, you need to address it. Stop it right there. So I want to give you four reasons why in the text this morning. Number one, it's going to be super straightforward. False teaching should be stopped because I know this is obvious. Let's just start here, though. It's false. (laughs) Right? Paul writes and says, as I urged you, interesting wordage, which is like wording, but wordage. If Paul gets to coin some words today, so do I, okay? Paul has a word today, I get a word today. Interesting wordage. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, he's telling Timothy to remain at Ephesus or stay. I want you to stay. Now, I'm not sure this was Timothy's first choice of assignment, if you're tracking with me. Most people, when they're, Timothy's 35 years old, uh, he's a young guy. Uh, He's been doing ministry for a while with the uh, Apostle Paul, uh, but this is a big, big responsibility. Let me just tell you, coming out of seminary, most people want the successful pastorate, not the one that's going to have suffering involved in it. Most people want to go in and be like, wow, you're pre, it changed the whole church, it changed the whole city, your church, your ministry, your preaching is amazing. Nobody's going in and goes, hey, there's a lot of problems, there's some significant doctrinal problems. There's some significant gospel problems, and it's in the highest place of the church, and that's exactly where I want you to go. I think most people are like, yeah, can I, can I go with B? Can I get something else? Do I really have to go here? And that's why I think he uses the word urge here, which is the word to come alongside. This is why I urged you. It's para kaleo, to call to one side. Paul's urging Timothy hand, arm around his shoulder. This is where I need you to be. You need to remain here so that, here's why. This is why it's so important. I can't have you go somewhere else. Your first pastorate, this pastorate, is going to be a suffering pastorate, not a successful pastorate, but this is where the work of ministry is. I need you to do this. You need to charge them, which is this word of military command. You, a 35-year-old pastor, need to go in there and you need to charge them, which is the word of a superior speaking to an inferior in a military context. You need to charge them. You need to direct them. You need to command them not to, has this idea of you need to forbid them. These certain persons who were few but of significant influence in the church Here you go, 35-year-old man sent for this work to certain persons, not just anyone's, but the most influential in the church, likely uh, amongst the elder board. The, the way I see that in certain persons is because if you note the other mentions of the named opponents Paul addresses, for example, in 1 Timothy 1, verse 20, Hymenaeus and Alexander were men That had obviously happened earlier, but the fact that I would lean towards them being elders in the church is due to them being teachers, which we'll see in verse 7. And seeing that as being the unique role of the elders, Paul clarifies in 1 Timothy 3.2 and 1 Timothy 5.18, it would seem that this is what Paul or Timothy has to do. He has to go and address the elders, certain elders, certain key leaders in the least, Listen to this, not to teach any different doctrine. Remember when I told you Paul made up a word today? He made up the word for different doctrine. Let's see if you can hear some of what's in this word in the Greek. Hetero didaskalon. What do you pick up in that word? How about, how about just hetero? So didaskalon is the foundation for teaching, but hetero, we use it as in you are heterosexual, for example. You're attracted to someone of a different gender. 
Heterodidaskalon is a word that's only used twice in the New Testament. They're both in 1 Timothy. One is in chapter 1 and one is in chapter 6. Paul is charging Timothy to forbid them from teaching any heterodidaskalon, a different teaching of a different kind. Now, we don't understand exactly from immediately where we are what is included here in this trademarked word by Paul, but chapter 6, verse 3 does help us. And in chapter 6, verse 3, Paul addresses this word a little bit more and says this. He says, if anyone teaches a different doctrine, here it is, and does not agree with the words, the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness. So what is the different doctrine? It's something that does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, namely that which we have in the scriptures to keep it simple there. None of that. Paul uses the word hetero again in another book that we've studied. How about the book of Galatians? They were teaching a hetero euangelion. They were teaching a another gospel. You remember that? And Paul addresses that and says, not that there is another one. See, this is the issue with false teaching. It's like, well, I like the teaching. It's different. Well, that's the po- problem. It's different. Man, I love this guy. He, he, this preacher, he's so good. He just has so many different takes on things that I've just never heard. Okay, well, they're probably false. <laughs> like, different is not a win. We, like, celebrate it. Like, oh, we just need some freshness in the church. They've had the same message forever. <laughs> yeah, huh? And if it's different, it's probably because it's made up. And if it's new, it's obviously not true. The the problem, and even Paul says this in Galatians, it's you are retreating, you are moving to another gospel, not that there is another one. There's just the true one and perversions of that one, which is ultimately deception, false, and untrue. And oh, by the way, all of it is done with a Bible in hand. All of it is done with the Bible in hand. All of it is done at the highest levels of scholarship. All of it is done at a level that could confuse 90% of who's in here. Just so you know. All of it's done at a level of persuasion, at a level of confusion, at a level of research that could be overwhelming to the majority. The problem with different is that there isn't different, there's other. There's true and there's false. There's true and there's perversions of what's true. I love this, Irenaeus. Irenaeus lived from 130 to 202 AD. He said in his work against heresy, quote, error indeed is never set forth in its naked deformity. Lest being thus exposed, it should at once be detected but it is craftily decked out in an attractive dress so as by its outward form to make it appear to the inexperienced more true than the truth itself, end quote. Look at a church's gospel understanding. Look at a church's gospel placement. Not just their understanding, where do they place the gospel? How important is the gospel? Do they see the gospel as something like, you know, like, yeah, it's kind of so foundational that we don't even talk about it anymore. It's assumed here. A church that assumes the gospel is a problem. Look look at the testimonies of people who are getting baptized in the church. When they're in your small group and you're having conversations with them and you ask them, why were you baptized? And they tell you that they were baptized. I mean, I I heard heard the craziest couple baptism stories a couple weeks ago where some gal was saying that the reason she was being baptized was because she wanted God's strength to empower her to send an army of angels into the rainforest to help her save animals and help with animals. And she felt like baptism was going to help in that. And they celebrated that and they baptized her. If baptism isn't about your identification with the work of Jesus Christ on behalf of you, a sinner 
who has lived for you, providing you his obedience in your place, who has died for you, rightly taking for you, him willingly taking upon himself the full measure of the wrath of God deserving your sins, and three days later rose from the grave conquering sin and death, and you've done nothing but sin. The only thing you've committed to is, is sin. The only thing you've helped with is sin. Jesus Christ has done everything else, and you've received his work as a free gift of God's grace through faith in him alone. That's it. And if you're not testifying to that in the waters of baptism, that you are a sinner and Christ is a great savior, we're off. Ask people what they're saved from. You get a good sense of where they are. Here's the second thing we need to talk about. It's false. False teachers, they, we, if they get away from the gospel, it needs to be rejected. Why? Because it's false. Second, because it's fruitless. Here's another aspect of this. Misguided preaching produces misguided pursuits. Do you hear that? That is so, 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 so important. You go, I'm not sure if I should be here or not. Look at the fruit. I'm putting quotes around it. Fruit. Because I just said it's fruitless, so I would be defeating my own point. It's not real fruit, but false teaching produces something. It leads you somewhere. Misguided preaching produces misguided pursuits. Ask the people in the church, what are you about? What do you do? What do you spend your time with? What are you preoccupied by? What fascinates? What excites you? What gets you guys fired up as a people? Misguided preaching will produce misguided pursuits. Look at the fruit. You want to see if it's off? Look at the fruit. Notice what's going on here. They were teaching different doctrine. And here's the behavior that came with it nor to devote themselves to myths. So you're not supposed to, you're going to charge them not to teach any different doctrine, nor here's the behavior, devote themselves to different myths and endless genealogies. Now, it's important to start by saying Paul doesn't specifically describe the false teaching for us. I think, I think we want that, right? We want to know exactly what it is because we will be strong with it. <laughs> if it comes here, yeah, we'll get it. And we don't get that. We don't exactly know. We're, we're going to put some things together in the context of the pastoral epistles and see if it's helpful for us to get a sense for what it is. I, I have a general idea, but the bottom line is Paul's not as focused on us knowing what the false teaching was. He wants us to know what to do with it when we see it. What to do with it when the gospels mess with. What do you do with it? You stop them. You charge them to cease and desist. That's what he wants us to know. They were inevitably, because of the teaching... Here's what was going on. Here's the behavior they were devoting themselves. They were occupied with, they were obsessed with. This is the thing they were doing as a church. Devoting means to occupy or to be obsessed with. They are obsessed with myths. You know what the word myth is, right? In the New Testament, it's nothing different than what you would probably think of today as a tale or a fable regarded as untrue. But you'd want to know what kind of myths, right? You're like, I've read Aesop's fables. Is that what we're talking about? If you follow the word through the pastoral epistles, you know when I, when I say pastoral epistles, you know what I'm talking about? 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, okay, pastoral epistles. According to 1 Timothy 4, 7, these myths were worldly. According to 2 Timothy 4, 7, sorry old ladies, um, they were old wives tales, little stories old wives Old ladies tell themselves old wives' tales. Titus calls them Jewish in Titus 1.14. So there's something to that. These myths, they were Jewish myths. They were worldly myths. They were old wives' tales. Titus 3.9 goes on to call them unprofitable and useless. 2 Timothy 4.4 4 says that these people were so devoted to these myths that they were turning away from the truth. Some say, well, maybe it was creation tales that they built and expanded out of the book of Genesis. It's possible. We don't know exactly. Not to devote themselves to these myths, these stories that weren't true, or endless genealogies. Genealogies, again, unclear exactly what's going on here, but there was some sort of speculation going on about the teachers regarding the family trees in the Old Testament. 
going back to the history of the patriarchs and reading some bizarre, sometimes even allegorical, likely meaning into these Old Testament genealogies. And the point of Paul saying that they were endless is that there was never a place where it stopped and so there was never end any result and so it never benefited in any way that produced fruit of any kind that would be beneficial to the Christian. It was fruitless. It was endless conversation. There was so much conversation in it, you probably could study it and it was enough to get a PhD in. Paul's highlighting the fruitlessness here. There was no fruit produced. Notice what happened instead. There was nothing of fruit produced, but rather it, promotes, it promoted speculations. Instead of truth, they just question and question and question, which creates confusion, by the way. It seems noble, though, doesn't it? Just ask a ton of questions over and over again. Little doubt here, a little doubt there. Unraveling somebody's dogmatic conviction about the Christian faith in some key portion of the gospel. First Timothy 6.4 would describe this problem in this way. Promoting speculation, they had an unhealthy craving for controversy and quarrels, which produce envy and dissension and slander and evil suspicion. They had a way of questioning that was subtly a way of undermining the authority of the scriptures. They were pontificating about the Old Testament in a way that eroded anyone's convictional theology about the Old Testament. They were talking about the law in a way that was somehow promoting its use for the righteous instead of the law being that which reveals our Sin and our need for Jesus. It would have all probably seemed so noble. Wow, it's just amazing what they're coming up with. They're, they're helping me think through things so differently. I am so grateful for these teachers. You know what this sounded like to me? Where a lot of Christian colleges are. Uh, we just want to give you a place to wrestle with your doubts. Are you sure, or are you just endlessly creating them yourself? It's amazing that you can go to a lot of Christian colleges with some convictions, and by the end you have none, except that the convictions you used to have aren't true. That's a fail, by the way. You're so old-fashioned, you don't understand it right. Ask these questions. Listen, like if you're getting religion from someone who doesn't ultimately believe the Bible, whether they call themselves Christian or not, that is a problem. And all it does is produce speculation, endless questioning, fruitless questioning, doesn't get you anywhere, doesn't arrive at anywhere beneficial, doesn't help in any way. God help us because there's something that they're missing here. Instead of moving towards truth, which produces stewardship, Paul says, all what they have going on produces speculation. They're using the Bible, but they're using it unbiblically. This is very, very common in our day, and it continues to lead us to the third aspect of why this teaching must be stopped. Number one, because it's false. Number two, because it's fruitless. Number three, because it's faithless. It's faithless. The problem is they were teaching this different doctrine, different of another kind, different as in different than the truth. They were teaching false stuff that was leading them to being occupied or obsessed with myths and endless genealogies, speculating and pontificating about all this stuff, questioning and subtly eroding the gospel foundation that was underneath them. He says this, rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith, 
False teaching, all that does is promote speculation. It doesn't get you to the stewardship from God that is by faith. That's the problem. Now, we just have to understand what the stewardship from God is because I think we can agree that's probably one of the most confusing parts for us looking at the text today. What does he mean by it promotes speculation rather than the stewardship that is from God? Well, it's actually helpful if you look at how Paul uses the word stewardship in a figurative sense in some of his other letters. I think Paul's using the word stewardship Oikonomia, which is this kind of like um, administration or stewardship, Paul uses it in a figurative sense to speak of God's plan of redemption, the saving plan of God. See, you get different doctrine that leads you into myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculation instead of getting you to the saving plan of God, which is by faith. See, wherever they were taking you, it was never ultimately arriving at the feet of the gospel where you could understand that you before a holy God are a sinner, that you cannot do anything to mitigate or um, make up for the sin that you have committed against the holy God. You are in need of a savior. His name is Jesus. He's come in the flesh. He's lived, died, and rose for you, accomplishing all that you need. And it was all that was needed in the sense that you could never do what was needed. He did it, and by faith in him, you can be forgiven of your sins. The gospel is about salvation from sin. Now, if you get to a teaching that doesn't ultimately lead to you're a sinner and you're in need of a savior and Jesus Christ is a savior and you can receive the work he's done for you by faith, we're in a problem place. False teaching will get you somewhere that'll promote speculation, but you need the gospel. You need to get to a place where you realize it's not about your works, it's not about your efforts, it's not about what you put into how to appease God by how many old ladies you walk across the street, how many houses you build, all the nice, you're an influencer on social media. Cool. That won't get you into heaven. Your good deeds won't get you into heaven. Oh, I'm a really good person. You're not holy. And if you were to stand, it doesn't matter. You're a really good person by your own standard. You're a really good person by the standard you got at public school. You're a really good person by a whole maybe number of religious standards, but the standard of God is you must be perfect according to his standard and you have fallen woefully short. And so if teaching isn't ultimately leading you to the saving knowledge of God, the plan of God's redemption, which is by faith, you are in a place that is a concern. That different doctrine keeps you from the gospel. That's what he's saying. That stewardship from God is the gospel. Heterodoxy, heterodoxy, orthodoxy being right teaching, heterodoxy attacks the gospel. Little question here, little quarreling there. Let's pick at sin a little bit, right? Let's pick at original sin. Let's just pick at it enough till you don't believe it anymore. Let's pick at atonement. Let's talk about atonement and talk about how it's really just a form of divine child abuse and how dare a modern mind conceive of what has happened in God offering his son to be a substitutionary atoning sacrifice for us, right? Let's pick at the atonement or let's pick at the savior or let's pick at... You name it, it erodes the gospel, and before you know it, you are down a path which promotes speculation and ultimately devolves the Christian faith into nothing more than a perverted system of works righteousness. You start adding things to it, like in order to make up for the sins of my ancestors, I have to continually, constantly do something to assuage this guilt. Maybe I have to add something. I won't get married to show how Christian I am. I'm only going to eat certain foods because I'm really spiritual. The stewards, God's stewards, were not making their teaching about God's plan of salvation, which is by faith. No, they were occupied with devoting themselves to myths and to genealogies. By the way, you could fill that in with some stuff today, I'm sure right? Fill in the blank with what's going on today. They were filling you with, and you were occupied with all kinds of things, speculation of the flesh instead of the plan of God, which is accessed by faith in Jesus Christ alone. It's faithless. 
if you at some point aren't having a conversation of, but how in the world can I be right with God? It is by faith alone in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. There is no other way. No matter how smart someone talks, no matter how confused you now are about the atonement, oh, and oh, let me tell you about the Jewish understanding of that. Don't let it trump God's word. And listen, if we've gotten away from the gospel, we are seriously just a lame social club. If you and I gather together and we don't have the gospel at our foundation, what are we doing? This is so lame. This is, this is stupid. And you guys are all dumb for getting up early on a Sunday. You are, you are 100%. I'm serious. If this is not about the gospel, if there isn't a risen savior that's ascended to the right hand of God, that's ruling and reigning and interceding for those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, this is a waste. See, every other, isn't it interesting that even Christianity, any other demonic form of religion, which is everything but Christianity, that's right, I'm saying it, every other religion is demonic, period. Demonic. Forget the myth of neutrality. Oh, it's, but they do nice things. That is part of its being demonic. It's called being a wolf in sheep's, sheep's clothing. Every other religion is a breakdown of the gospel that gets us back to human accomplishment over divine achievement. That's it. It starts to whittle back down to this is what you do. This is what you do with the law. This is how you obey the law. This is how you feel good about yourself. This is how you get to a... Con you know what? We'll just make you feel about yourself as you are because as long as you're acting true to you, nobody else needs to tell you. You're the boss of you. All that stuff, guys, is just demonic. And Paul goes on and he finishes in this way. He says the whole problem with the stewardship part that they're missing, the fact that all this is promoting speculation instead of leading you to the saving plan of God, the gospel, which is by faith, the whole issue is it misses the mark. It fails to hit God's mark of what the ultimate goal is. God gives us the gospel and that is supposed, supposed to produce the kind of people that is after something in particular and it leads us to the fourth reality of why the fails of false teaching are such a problem we should stop them at all costs, namely that it's loveless. This teaching is false. It is fruitless. It doesn't produce anything of spiritual value. It is faithless. It doesn't lead you to the gospel that you can only be saved through faith in Jesus from your sin, and it's sin that you need to be saved from. The effects of sin, the penalty of sin that you need to be saved from, and namely, it is loveless. Notice this. He says, the aim of our charge is love. The goal of biblical instruction is love. When you get the gospel, gospel people are loving. Now, what's interesting about that is the fact that, would you agree, many, many false teachings and false teachers are attractive because they seem uber-loving. And yet this is saying the opposite. Whatever you're seeing of that, apart from the gospel producing a kind of love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, because true or false teaching doesn't get there, it fails to produce true love. Whereas gospel faithful Bible teaching calls men to salvation in Christ, and God produces that love through them as they walk in obedience to his word by the power of the Holy Spirit. What are they missing? Well, they, they miss the source. They need to know where love comes from. It doesn't come from adding or subtracting or reinterpreting God's word. It doesn't come from focusing on a list of commandments and striving to conform to them. No, you will see where the source of this love is. The aim, the telos is the word. The end, the goal is love. And it comes from this source, this threefold source, a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. This is what they were missing. They didn't have a pure heart, they didn't have a good conscience, and they didn't have a sincere faith. They missed it because they drifted off and away from the saving plan of God in the gospel, which is by faith alone. They didn't have that, and so what are they missing? They were missing a pure heart. A pure heart is a heart that is cleansed from sin. The aim of our 
charge is love. It comes from a pure heart, a heart that is cleansed from sin, pure in the inner man. The idea of heart is the inner man because you have come to Jesus Christ for the once and for all fountain of cleansing and found him and his blood shed for you on the cross to be gloriously, and I will say it like this, ongoingly sufficient for you. And when you know what it's like to have your sin completely atoned for, completely covered, completely forgiven because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, all your sin, even the sin you've yet to commit, that wells up in an amazing demonstration of a life of love. He goes on and says, good conscience. If it's a heart cleansed from sin, a good conscience is one that's cleared of guilt. A good conscience is such a gift, isn't it? When you can honestly evaluate yourself based on what true, what's really true and what's really false, what's really good and what's really evil, and you can live in light of it, isn't a good conscience also awesome to know when you should and when you shouldn't repent? How many Christians are living in that, though, just stressed out? Oh, here, here's another one. A good conscience not only leads you to being cleared of the guilt because you know what Jesus has done on your behalf, it leads you to the truth so you know the difference between true, true and false and good and evil, but then it leads you to the place of when you know to repent and when you know to stop when it's been sufficient, when you've actually repented to move on. S somebody needs to hear that today. You just wallow in this ongoing, you think you're, you're, it's a work. Your repentance is becoming a work instead of a gift of God's grace to draw you back to the fountain of cleansing, namely the Lord himself. Paul doesn't have a perfect conscience, but he says in 1 Corinthians 4, I'm not worried about a human court judging me. I don't have anything against myself, not that I'm innocent, but bottom line is I don't stand before you, and as far as it goes between me and the Lord, everything that I can see has been dealt with, and therefore I walk in freedom. Clarity of conscience. And then this, a sincere faith. All their conversations, they didn't get to a heart that was cleansed from sin. They weren't producing people that were leaning into Jesus, seeing Jesus as the only hope but a glorious hope, having hearts cleansed from sin, having consciences that were working rightly and cleared of guilt, and a sincere faith. This is a faith devoid of hypocrisy. You are actually a true believer, genuine as opposed to fake or phony. You trust in, you rely upon, you put all the eggs of your hope in the basket of the finished work of Jesus Christ. He is your savior, you know no other. You are a beggar. You have come to the table with nothing. You have been gifted everything. What you come to the table with is your own sin. Everything else is you've received by faith alone in Jesus. And now by his spirit, he empowers in you and produces through you what you could not produce in yourself, namely the end of the aim of the Christian life, which is love. If you think you can get to love on your own and you're seeing, wow, everyone's being so loving in the world, J just so you know, if it's not coming from God, it's not ultimately true love because you will be outed in the motives. True love is a self-giving, self-sacrificing, you before me for the glory of God kind of love. And that cannot be produced apart from the power of the gospel and the working of the Holy Spirit. You can get false manifestations and you can get a bunch of activism. But if you think that's selfless, if you think it's self-sacrificing, and if you think it's for the glory of God, you are sorely mistaken. And in fact, he says certain people by swerving from these, what is these? Well, a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith, because they've swerved from these, because they've missed the mark on these, you didn't even arrive in the right destination. They've been teaching and teaching and teaching and never arrived at the fact that you could have a pure heart in Jesus. You know that? You today could have a pure heart, a heart cleansed from sin, and you have done nothing but put your faith in Jesus, his person and his work. You can have a pure heart. False teaching never got them there. 
They never got to a good conscience. They never got to a sincere faith. And because of that, they have wandered. They have turned astray. They have turned aside. They have turned to vain discussion. They have turned to this idle, useless, empty talk that leads nowhere kind of talk. And it's like, man, Paul's like, not here, not anywhere. In the true church, should there be teaching that ultimately leads you to a place where you're not confronted in the most glorious way about the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are led to the joy, the the tremendous gift that it is to have a pure heart, not because of what you do to purify it, but because what Jesus Christ has done to make you pure. A conscience that is clear because everything that could ever be known about your life that you've hidden and that you've made, it's been revealed to others and to yourself has all been taken away and done away with through the work of Jesus Christ and a sincere faith, which is a gift of the Lord that not only saves you in the sense that God receives, you get that gift, uh, that faith as a free gift and God forgives you of your sin by putting your faith in Jesus, but it's that same faith that empowers you to now walk out the love that comes to one who understands who Jesus is. Paul's so fired up about this. He's seeing this as the first issue and he sees it as the main issue. And as long as we are alive, may we keep our eyes open, our Bibles open, and may we pay close attention to ourselves our lives, and our doctrine. Let's pray. Father, it is, um, it's amazing to just to think of how many ways that we can get off from the gospel. It's amazing how we can at one point champion in the gospel and then and in another moment just completely assume the gospel. But there seems to be this progression, Lord, in, in scripture about one generation believing the gospel, the next generation assuming the gospel, and then we, we can deny the gospel. And God, we don't want to be that either. Father, we want to be a people that treasure the gospel, the good news. Gospel means good news. Father, thank you for the good news of Jesus Thank you, Woody, for what he's done for sinners like us, for those so undeserving that you've made a way to be right with you through his finished work, through the work of your son. The work of your son who, if we've seen him, we've seen the father, Jesus says. The work of the perfect one who was perfectly obedient to replace our disobedient lives, who was willingly willing to go to the cross to suffer and die for our sin and rose on the third day conquering sin and death so that sinners aware of their sin convicted by it could come to a true fountain of cleansing and know through Jesus that they are made right with you because by faith your righteousness the righteousness of your son is imputed to them and all their unrighteousness imputed to Christ on the cross. Father, thank you for that reality. May we be a people wholeheartedly committed, celebrating of and prioritizing the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.